All right, so we're going to be talking about quantum computing. This is part 13 in our quantum computing discussion series. I've mentioned this before, but I, I mentioned it before live. I don't know if I've ever told my YouTube audience, but once I get to 1,000 subscribers, I will do my first ever YouTube live stream um, where we're going to do something fun. I am, I'm planning it out now, so if you are, um, if you are a lurker who's been watching my channel, uh, uh, feel free to hit the subscribe button. Once we hit 1,000 subs, I will do a YouTube live stream. I've always thought of myself as a live streamer, not as a content creator in the YouTube video sense. <coughs> so... Um, that is definitely where I excel at. So if you'd like to, uh, you know, if you'd like to see one on YouTube because you prefer YouTube over Twitch, that's the goal. Get to 1,000 subs and we'll make it happen. Um, but in the meantime, you can always come over to my Twitch channel and follow along where everybody's watching right now. Oh, I turned off chat, so you guys can't even say hi. But you're, they're here. You'll just have to take my word for it. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, and so today we're doing the quantum mechanical uh, quantum computation discussion series. We're on part 13, uh, and we're going to see some interesting things like the postulates of quantum mechanics and uh, unitarity again, um, but more so we're going to be talking about time evolution, Hamiltonians, Schrodinger equation. If you have been following along, wouldn't say hi if I could, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thanks, cool. <laughs> Thank you, cool. Uh, so we're following along with this excellent book by Nielsen and Chung. Um, if, you are, if you have it, if you're interested in following along, that's what we're following along in. I have put all of my notes available online in the Google Drive. You can find my notes using, if you're on Twitch chat right now, exclamation mark notes, and you'll get my notes there. Or if you are following on YouTube, the link will be in the description below. Um, <coughs> so that's where you can get it. Uh, and we are mostly covering some of the quantum mechanics that's necessary for quantum computation. So that's where we're at. Um, now, let's talk about last time. We always like to start with the last time. I always like to start with the last time, sort of go over what we did before. Last time we talked about commutators and anti-commutators. We talked about the commutation, or the commutator, I should say, being defined as if we have two operators, A and B, then this is going to be defined as A times B minus B times A. <coughs> now, we kind of showed some examples of this. Of course, in, in quantum mechanics, we can you know, look at uh, operators as matrices, and then it's just matrix multiplication. And we talked about what it meant if two operators like A and B actually commute. We say that they commute if this quantity right here is equal to 0 then they commute. And com commutation is not something that's new to us. Like, uh, not natural numbers commute. You know, we talked about what, what, do you, what would you do if 2 times 3 is not equal to, two th to 3 times 2. That'd be weird, right? That'd be very strange in every single situation of algebra growing up. <coughs> but in quantum mechanics, that does happen. And one of these ways that it did happen that we talked a lot about were the poly matrices. So we ended up coming up with a closed form of the poly matrices, where if you have poly matrix J and commute uh, commuting with poly matrix K, then it's going to be equal to 2 times I times the sum from 1 to 3 with this Levy Chivita symbol that we discussed last week of the poly matrix L. So you're summing over <coughs> L equals 1 through 3, and this is ultimately what we get. And you'll find that if the uh, with this symbol, if, if any of these indices are equal, then levy trivita goes to zero. Otherwise, you get a positive for one um, one formalism or a negative for another uh, another permutation of indices. Chivita, right? That's one you never heard. People crammed it in my head that it was pronounced levy chivita. Crammed it in my head. Like, I fought that tooth and nail, and they said, it's Chivita. Because I used to think it was Levi Civita. Makes more sense to me to say Levi Civita. But no. People got all worked up. All worked up. Anyways, for postulates of quantum mechanics, that's where we're going to start today. I'm going to just kind of read them from my notes, um, which is pretty much straight from the book, because that's the best of quantum mechanics. <coughs> Obviously, the authors do a fantastic job um, presenting this information far better than I could, so I'm not going to attempt to. I'm just going to reiterate what they're saying. Um, so postulate one of, of quantum mechanics is associated to any isolated physical system. 
is a complex vector space with inner product that is a Hilbert space known as the state space of the system. The system is a completely uh, is completely described by its state vector, which is a unit vector in the system's state space. So. What does that mean? Well, we talked all about Hilbert space. We talked Hilbert space kept creeping its way in a couple times. <coughs> a Hilbert space, you know, the space of states that we do all of this stuff in. Um, it has to have a couple things that go along with it. Um, but we, like I said, we've already talked, we've beaten the, the, the Hilbert out of that space. Um, so let's talk about postulate two because this is one where we haven't talked too much about and this is the one that's going to be more important to us moving forward. Um, and that is postulate two is the evolution of a closed quantum system is described by a unitary transformation. That is the state psi of a system at time t1 is related to the state psi prime at the time t2 by a unitary operator which depends only on the time t1 and t2. So we could say, you know, we talked about one, that's from the notes. <coughs> Excuse me. And two is just going to be basically that we have some unitary transformation from for uh, where psi prime is equal to the unitary tra trans the unitary operator applied to the psi state. Now, at first sight, this is not too bad. You know, this is something that we've dealt with a lot. You have a state, you apply an operator. This operator has to be something specific, like you know, if we want something observable, we want Hermitian or whatnot. If we want something. <laughs> Excuse me, if we want something unitary, it's going to be a U, you know, like this is, we've talked about these things before. Okay, so it might be natural to ask what type of unitary operators are actually natural. And surprise, surprise, we've already seen a bunch. Like what type of unitary options is something that we might like experience in the world of quantum computing. And of course, the Pauli matrix X, which is like the swap gate, the Pauli matrix Z, which is like a phase, tra a phase swap um, state. Uh, and then, what do they call it? What the authors call it? I think they call it a phase swap state. And then, uh, woo, woo, woo. And then uh, the Hadamard gate, which is like, you know, taking a uh, gate and putting it in a super, or taking a bit and putting it in superposition. <coughs> um, that cough is worse. I have my vaccine as well, <laughs> Admiral. I've been back since April. <laughs> it's just a head cold. It's just a head cold. My whole family had it. <clears throat> that's all. Um, some that we learned, oh yeah, so that's what the, some of the operators that we're used to is the swap gate, the, um, the Z gate, and both of them are poly matrices, X and Z, and then also the Hadamard gate. Now, postulate two, this one right here, has some subtleties that we need to talk about. And I think that that's the most exciting and important thing from today's lesson is the subtleties that exist with this postulate two. Okay? Firstly, the system is closed. <laughs> like, what? Like, how many closed systems actually truly exist in nature? If you said anything other than one, well, you're incorrect, unfortunately. And even so, we're not even 100% sure that that system is closed in the true sense. Uh, that system, of course, being the universe. Um, but it's, the thing is, is that, that everything can be approximated to have, um, <coughs> to have, it's close enough, like it's possible to describe an approximately closed system, and that's what we do all the time on a general basis, is we, we have approximately closed systems. And that's, in, in essence, that's what we're trying to do with quantum computing, to break decoherence problems, right? Is we're trying to, con to make our systems closer and closer to being closed system, right? But the issue is that that's, you know, that's impossible to make a truly closed system, and ultimately it's really difficult to make even close to a closed system. <laughs> it interacts so much <laughs> with everything else. Uh, so that's one of the postulates, that's one of the problems with postulate two is that there's really no such thing as a closed system. All systems do have outside interactions, but it is possible to describe closed systems and we can get really good results. So approximately closed systems. Uh, postulate two also describes the system at two times, um, which don't know if you know this or not, but that means it's not continuous. So that's an issue. We have to fix that, right? And postulate two is actually easily fixed by introducing the ever famous, um, for good reason, Schrodinger equation. Going back to the basics on this one, right? We have I h bar times d dt on psi, which is equal to the Hamiltonian times psi. Now, this is not the Hadamard, this is the Hamiltonian, so we do have to be <coughs> maybe a little bit um, ambitious about saying when I'm writing the Hamiltonian versus the Hadamard, but 
Nevertheless, this is the Hamiltonian for the Schrodinger equation. Um, and now we have a continuous, uh, a continuous, basically a continuous postulate two in time. This is sometimes called like a, post a postulate two like prime. <laughs> you know, that's what the authors refer to it as. Um, so a Hamiltonian is a weird thing in quantum information scenarios because the Hamiltonian is not usually very significant, which might strike you as weird because if you've taken a lot of quantum mechanics, the Hamiltonian is everything. <laughs> the Hamiltonian is the energy eigenstates and eigenvalues, right? That exists in the Hamiltonian, which we're going to write as the following, right? The Hamiltonian can be uh, written as the sum over all of the energy eigenvalues applied to the, the um, outer product of the energy eigenstates. I mean, it's a matrix, so you should expect this form, not an inner product, which is a constant. Um, where this E is the energy eigenvalues, energy, ooh, rough, whoo, whoo, spelling, energy <laughs> eigen values, uh, and this is the energy eigenstates, energy eigenstates, with a diagonalized Hamiltonian, okay? Now, um, but yeah, so in information theory and in quantum computing, how often do we do with a Hamiltonian? Not too often. Why? Well, like, look at your diagrams. Look at your quantum circuit diagrams. It's like, here's a bit, here's a bit, you know, here's a bit, here's a bit, here's a bit, here's a bit. Here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a uh, gate, you know, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a gate, you know, here's a gate. You know, and wh what are we doing? We're not talking about Hamiltonians here. We're talking about, like, <coughs> excuse me, taking a bit and manipulating it in some way. Right? And that's kind of mostly what we're interested in when we're talking about quantum information, quantum computings. Now, there is some differences with that. For example, like, uh, suppose, like, currently right now my group is thinking about a quantum computer. Right? So what are we doing with this quantum computer that hasn't been made yet? Well, first you've got to talk about how things are even going to happen inside of that quantum computer. Right? Like, how can you take a, a, a quantum object and put it into a state 0 or a state 1? For that, you need to talk about the Hamiltonian. How is the magnetic field going to interact with whatever material you're using to create this one state versus zero state? Welcome How is that going to change if you move this around? Weird. Uh, doctor, thank you for the follow. I'm going to call you doctor. Thank you for the follow. Hopefully that was your intention. <coughs> um, but yeah, so then how do we go from taking this... Uh, you know, this, and that's, so that's where the Hamiltonian does come into play with quantum computing. It's ultimately how do you arrange... But once you get to that bit of zeros and ones, Hamiltonian doesn't, there's no really Hamiltonian that we want to talk about. Um, so like, what do we do? Like, what if you were insistent, right? Uh, but before we get there, let's talk about the energy eigenstate. Um, is the energy eigenstate is also sometimes called a stationary state, um, which has to do with the fact that you can only gain numerical factors over time. So like this energy eigenstate, um, after some time later, it's just going to be e to the i, e t over h bar times the state again, right? So this is why it's called stationary state. It's energy. <coughs> now, there are a lot more complicated systems that we're not going to get into, but uh, again, this is just something to note that this is also sometimes calls an uh, eigenenergy state, or I'm sorry, a stationary state, because it only gains uh, numerical factors over time and only changes by constants. Now, let's talk about a single... Hamiltonian, or I'm sorry, a single qubit Hamiltonian, okay? Just so say, like, we want to see what a Hamiltonian might look like in quantum mechanics. Is there this relationship in quantum computer, quantum computing between Hamiltonians and time evolution and all that other jazz? Spoiler alert, yes. Let's talk about how. Um, so let's write down a Hamiltonian. Something you might expect would be, like, h bar omega, where this might be, like, the interaction or something along those lines, <coughs> times the swap gate. Okay? Cool. I guess the first thing is to figure out is does H commute with X? Maybe somebody in chat can answer that. Maybe somebody in chat would like to answer that. Does H commute with X? Uh, and while that's happening, I'll say, Merlin, welcome to, the, uh, welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. So does H commute with X? 
when, when h bar and omega are just constants, right? <laughs> cool. Oh, jeez. Cool, you broke it. Oh, man. You had me cracking up. The panic is real. Okay, we're back. Uh, so cool is correct and said it in the perfect way ever. Um, yes, it does. Duh. Well, why? Well, let's, let's write it out really quickly. It's not too hard to see. Does it commute? Uh, let's see. H, X minus X. H, what is X? Or what, I'm sorry, what is H? Well, that's just going to be H bar omega times X, X minus X, X. Cool. Okay. So now it's obvious. Now it's obvious no matter what way to write this that, yes, X will definitely commute with itself. So <coughs> what does that mean? Well, that means that these have the same eigenbasis. So the eigenbasis of X is going to be the same eigenbasis of H for the system. So what are they? Well, that's going to be the famous ones that we talked about way in the way, way, way in the beginning, probably like episode two of this, right? Is we have one eigenbasis that looks like this and one eigenbasis that looks like this. Uh, you know, the st state 0 plus the state 1 over root 2 and the state 0 minus the state 1 over root 2. Okay? Those are our two eigenvectors. So now consider with the postulate 2 that we have. A solution to the Schrodinger equation will take this following form. If we have psi at time 2 equal to <coughs> our e to the uh, minus i h times t2 minus t1. Okay? Ooh, T1, there we go. That was rough over H bar. Times the same state. Oh, I'm sorry, times the evolution of the state. T1, there we go. The unevolved state, I should say. Then this is also just going to be equal to some unitary operator, T1, T2, um, applied to the state at T1. I don't know what's buzzing around me, but it's freaking me out. <laughs> so what is this? So well then we can just reduce this to saying you are unevolved, this, Kappa. Huh? You are unevolved, Kappa. What? Uh oh. I thought of tearing being wait, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Oh the thought of tearing being buying a motorcycle and driving it around my house. And just yelling I hate you from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord. That is hilarious. Um, so anyway, so now we can see that this is obviously going to be a unitary transformation, just like we thought it was from using our postulate 2. We know that this is exactly how time's going to evolve, and how does it, and so that means that this is a unitary operator, right? Good. Great. What's the deal with all this unitary business, though? Right? This is, we've talked about this, and we've been talking about it, we talked about it for the first, like, 45 minutes of, of today's stream. Like, what's the deal with the unitary business? Right? So, Next week, we have to talk about things that are not unitary, because that's ultimately these processes that are happening. Now, we, you know, we talked at the beginning of the stream about how, you know, like uh, the difference between having a single, taking a single measurement of a classical system versus a single measurement of a quantum system. A single measurement of a classical system, you can get an answer that is correct to some uncertainty. The single measurement of a quantum system, you can't know anything about the quantum system. You need a lots and lots of measurements. In order to get that, you know, in order to get an understanding of what's going on in the system. Oh, it's just a huge horsefly. That's gross. What are you doing here? Tyrion? <clears throat> okay. Anyways, um, so, <clears throat> so when you're coding up these computer systems and everything like that, this is where it becomes interesting. Because now when you're coding, like you know that the quantum system is not going to get, is not going to give you an appropriate measurement or an appropriate understanding of physics after a single measurement, but you still have to code it that way. And then you just run a bunch of iterations. So we're going to code it with measurement gates. All of our quantum circuits are going to have measurement gates. Measurement gates are, by definition, not unitary, right? Um, the unitary only happens when you measure enough to preserve the probability of the system. Um, so that's where it become, It can come back in after like an infinite amount of iterations. But um, that's all details. We'll talk about that more next week when we talk about measurement gates and what that entails. Okay. Oh, man. Today, though. Whew. Today. 
Alright, are you guys ready for a game show? Holy smokes. Is Tyrion here? No, don't don't call him. He's not here. We don't need to add that.